Colleagues, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this first session on green approaches to COVID-19 recovery. The pandemic has created an unprecedented situation resulting in significant economic challenges across the world. Effective, uh, effective and long-lasting post-COVID-19 economic recovery plans need to reflect coherently the three dimensions of sustainable development, putting the most vulnerable at the centre of recovery efforts. Whilst an enormous challenge, this process also presents an opportunity to strengthen the commitment made under the Paris Agreement and to invest into a more sustainable future with stronger health systems, fewer people living in extreme poverty, reduced inequalities, a healthier natural environment and more resilient societies. By approving national COVID-19 economic stimulus packages, parliamentarians can seize the opportunity for promoting a holistic recovery that encompasses all dimensions of sustainable development. Through their legislative and overseeing role, parliamentarians will be pivotal in embracing the opportunity, as Speaker Pelosi has just said, to build back better, ensuring current economic recovery endeavours adopt the principles of a green economy, such as low carbon development, resource efficiency and social inclusion. Our panel today will discuss and try to identify key parliamentary actions that can be taken to facilitate a recovery from the pandemic so that climate and development commitments linked to the Paris Agreement and other development agendas are met. How can parliaments and parliamentarians ensure that COVID-19 recovery plans support the transition to more sustainable economic models that are aligned with climate action and sustained development? What national efforts have been undertaken by parliaments to ensure recovery pa packages promote and address climate change? We have three main speakers with us today, each of whom will speak for eight minutes. At seven minutes, I will indicate one minute left, and at eight minutes, I will ring the bell to indicate that the time has ceased for speaking. I will now give the floor to Ms. Maria Neri, Department of Public Health, Environment and Social Determinants of Health, World Health Organization. So, Ms. Neri. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, dear parliamentarians. This is a great opportunity for us to address you. We know the power you have in your own country. We know how influential you can be, and therefore it's for us a fantastic, uh, and we are very grateful for, for giving us this opportunity. Being myself a medical doctor and being myself from the World Health Organization, you will not be surprised if I am here to present you the health argument for more climate action. You heard this morning many reasons from the economic point of view, from the environmental front point of view, from the emergency humanitarian inequities point of view, why do you need to act? Why as a society, we need to change completely our way of living, consuming, producing, recycling, and transforming our society. We heard as well the young people demonstrating in the streets. I think this is the first time in history where the, the children are telling us that what we are doing is blah, blah, blah. So let's look now at the health argument and see whether by using this health argument, by putting our lungs very much at front of all of this debate, by putting how our body, how the human health is affected by climate change, we can accelerate the, 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 the action on, uh, to tackle the causes of climate change and to be more ambitious. You know, on environmental conventions, you, you have to do things because you need to protect the planet. What we want to do here is to protect human health. And we have been losing a lot of time 
And as you can imagine, when he's talking about health, the time is really very, very short. But I will be very positive. In fact, the health arguments for more climate action on, on, on uh, more action on climate change are very positive. Essentially, what we are saying is that if you implement the Paris Agreement, if you execute, if you are committed to put in place what the, the requirements of the Paris Agreement are asking you to do, in fact, what you are doing, and maybe you don't know it, is to implement a public health treaty. And probably one of the biggest, strongest, and powerful public health treaty. The benefits for our health coming from tackling the causes of climate change will be extremely positive. If you tackle the causes of climate change, if you move to a more sustainable, renewable sources of energy, in fact, what you will do is one of the most immediate benefits will be the reduction on air pollution. And the reduction on air pollution will mean that we will be able to reduce the seven million premature deaths that we are having every year. And I repeat, seven million premature deaths that we are having every year due to exposure to air pollution. That will be one of the biggest benefits coming from tackling the causes of climate change will be good for the economy, will be good for the society, will be good to generate more jobs coming from renewable sources of energy, and at the same time, will stop polluting our lungs, polluting our cardiovascular system, polluting our brain, and causing all the horrible damage that is causing now. The moment we engage on this healthy energy transition, the benefits on the health system will pay by themselves the investments that you need to do now to move quickly and more ambitiously to those new sources of energy. Second good news, if we tackle the causes of climate change by moving into more sustainable food production and consumption, including the waste management of the food that we are now wasting, which represent one third of the production, if we move into that, Imagine the benefits for our health coming from healthy diets. Imagine that we could uh, engage on a nutritional pattern with healthy diets, and again, the benefits of that will be enormous. Today, we are still giving subsidies to fossil fuels. And you know what? On all of this uh, 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 estimation on how to provide subsidies to fossil fuels, you forget, or our politicians forget, to include an economic cost of that, which is that burning those fossil fuels are representing $5 trillion in cost for the health system. Means that the combustion of those fossil fuels are causing chronic diseases that will require the hospitalization for a long time, in addition to the death, of course, but in addition to that, losing years of healthy lifestyles that we are not, no, not able to do it because of our lungs will be uh, 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 affected by chronic respiratory diseases, among others. Use the legislation. WHO very recently has presented the new air quality guidelines. We know that there are very challenging. You, we know that there will require a lot of uh, political courage from you to, to change many things, but the lives that you will be able to save, if you implement the recommendations in terms of air quality uh, proposed by WHO, we could reduce by 80% the number of deaths caused now by exposure to air pollution, and this represents 5.6 million. Imagine that you as a politician you can reduce by 80% the 7 million deaths we have by, uh, caused by air pollution. That will be a fantastic political opportunity. I will vote for you if you do that. I'm sure that your citizens will vote for you, and I hope that you will be able to sell that argument as the most positive one. Nothing motivates people more than their own health. These days we are talking with uh, movements that are called Moms for, Moms for Clean Air, or moms warriors, because they see how climate change and air pollution is affecting asthma, for instance. They, who doesn't know an asthma patient? 
when you've been in touch with a child who cannot breathe, and then you need to, after treating that asthma case, you need to send that boy or girl back to a street where he will be again exposed to high levels of air pollution, then you need to change the legislation. Then you need to put in place an air that can be breathed. And this is all about uh, climate change mitigation. If you put in place all of those measures, you will have a better mobility, your people will be more active, less, uh, less sedentary lifestyle, less obesity, more social interaction in our cities. The mayors can help a lot on promoting this sustainable transport. The, the, the politicians, the parliamentarians, you can make sure that you have new laws giving us the right to a healthy, sustainable environment. And then you can claim as well the economic benefits that will be associated to all of that. I don't know, Mr. President, whether I need to finish here? 15 seconds. I finish. My argument is very clear. If with all of those positive news, with all of those health benefits that you can generate, you are still not convinced, then we cannot claim later on that we didn't know. We knew the science is there, the opportunities are there. Use the health as an argument because it will be very powerful and will accelerate action and people will understand and follow us. Thank you very much. Just in time. <laughs>
we are seeing that renewable energy and energy efficiency technologies across geographies are being driven by their low marginal cost. This is important because for reasons of competitiveness, for reasons of productivity, we are seeing that industries across the world are choosing technologies which have a lower cost of operation. Remember that fossil fuels, when they are used to make electricity, almost 50% of the cost of electricity is to pay for the fossil fuel. That's not the case in renewables. And that is why an increasing number of capacity generation that has been set up in the last two years has focused on renewables, not only by the public sector, but also by the private sector. These provide us with the conditions for countries to develop a thriving renewable energy sector that is globally competitive. It creates the conditions that favor the development and scale up of technologies that will drive the future for clean energy, including green hydrogen, including the evolution of the chemistry of solar cells, the chemistry of battery technologies, but all of these are inherently risk risk-taking technologies. We are seeing that, especially in the developing world, in the least developed countries and in the small island development states, investment money is not flowing in. And consequently, the move towards green is not happening. We need to correct that. Parliamentarians of the world, I request you that our challenge now is to get enough investment money into all countries and at interest rates that the countries are willing and able to pay. I will give you an example. In some sub-Saharan African countries, the interest rates on monies invested in solar are as high as 11 to 13% per year. At this rate, it is not sustainable. I request you, across the world to set up a global risk mitigation facility, a global risk mitigation facility, which would provide confidence to the private sector to invest in renewable energy in all parts of the world. This is important because this provides the ring of confidence within which investments, whether they are from banks, or from funds can flow in and expect that they will earn a healthy return. Signora e signori, by doing this, we help people get clean energy, especially those who have never had clean energy. We help people pay less for energy. We help people live in cleaner atmospheres, whether inside the house, or in larger urban areas. And we help the world to move towards a lower carbon trajectory and ultimately to a zero emissions future. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to your deliberations and hope that in the years ahead, we will see you come together to fight this risk of climate change and at the same time enable the improvement of the lives, the betterment of the lives of people. Thank you very, very much. Very many thanks, uh, Director General Matu. I now give the floor to Mr. Bruno Pozzi, Director of the United Nations Environment Programme Office for Europe. Mr. Pozzi. Thanks a lot, Mr. President, and uh, thanks a lot, uh, honorable uh, parliamentarians. Really pleased to be with you and represent the United Nations Environment Programme today. Let me start by some, uh, with some news coming from Geneva and the adoption uh, by the Human Rights Council of a resolution 
on the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. Just this afternoon as we were gathering, it, it is an incredible step uh, uh, towards incorporating this concept in international practice. And I wanted to start by this news that I see personally as a very good news. Uh, a month ago at the General Assembly, uh, the SG, uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, called for uh, action. He said we are on the verge of the abyss and we really need to take action. This is reflected in his uh, report, our common agenda, that was published a few weeks ago, and that puts climate, the environment and the planet at the heart of the global commons uh, that we have. Uh, uh, and uh, there I say, uh, making the environment maybe a, a public good that we need to look at. As, as you know, the planet is facing a triple planetary crisis and we hear a lot today about the climate change crisis, which is absolutely real and that we will uh, have to, 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 to take another step forward in, in tackling at COP26. But let me remind you as well about the crisis of biodiversity, which is absolutely real as well, with one million species being on the verge of extinction and the need in 2022 to adopt a new global framework on biodiversity. And let me remind you as well of the pollution crisis on air quality and other dimensions that have been tackled as well uh, uh, previously, making, making, bringing these three crises together as we head towards uh, these different COPs and UNR 5.2, uh, uh, one pollution notably on marine litter and plastic, uh, because we've got a chance to amalgamate uh, our efforts and really uh, put the grounds to tackle these three crises together. And COVID-19 definitely, with the recovery packages that it brings, is a chance, a unique chance, to accelerate action on uh, the Sustainable Development Goals and on those critical agendas. Uh, the green COVID recovery, uh, we've calculated in the UNEP uh, emission gap report, uh, uh, could, uh, if well spent, uh, cut off 25% of the emissions by 2030. And there's wide agreement uh, uh, across uh, all parts of the world that the most effective stimulus policies are those that create recovery through decarbonization, through backing nature and tackling pollution. But yet, we're not uh, building back a better uh, yet. Uh, uh, we've estimated in another report that was done with the University of Oxford, the IMF, UNDP and GIZ, that uh, out of 3,500 policies in 50 major economies in 2020, only 18% of the recovery spending and 2.5% of this total spending uh, add uh, uh, a positive green characteristics. And when you come to nature, which is the very fundament of our societies and of our economies, it is a disappointing small 3% uh, uh, amount of the total spending which is spent on it. So basically, uh, many of the big developed economies most responsible uh, for the three planetary crises are edging closer to a full return to the old polluting ways. And we need to do better. And for this, uh, we propose to invest in five areas. The first one uh, has been discussed already uh, uh, many times today. It's to provide efficient energy. Equity and connectivity, of course, to the people who need the energy, but at the same time, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by prioritizing clean and renewable energy, moving away from coal, redirecting fossil fuel subsidies. There's no future in fossil fuel. The second thing is to go to clean transport. Almost a quarter of the energy-related CO2 emissions are from the transport. And we can promote clean mass transit, cycling, walking networks. We can decrease emissions from the aviation sector as we've seen, for example, by replacing short domestic flights with rail journeys. The third sector is in the building. Green building and the construction industry is an important uh, contributor. I mean, the building industry is an important contributor to the emissions. So we can shift to clean energy and uh, energy efficiency in the building, but also to material efficiency. And uh, uh, if we do that, not only will you use less resources, 
but we will also green the construction sector, creating green jobs in it and improving the living and working conditions of many. Every $1 million which is invested in retrofits in building or in efficiency measures in new builds can create between 9 and 30 new jobs. The fourth sector is the natural capital. Nature-based solutions, ecosystems restoration are critical allies to fight climate change and restore biodiversity. If you invest in nature-based solution, you can provide about one third of the annual clim climate mitigation which is required by 2030 to keep the global warming to under two degrees Celsius. It's a solution that nature provides to fully decarbonize, to help fully decarbonize our economies. And as I said, actually at the moment, we only invest less than 3% of the recovery spending in nature capital. And that's a clearly missed opportunities that we hope we can seize in the future. The last sector is to invest in the clean research and development. We need to innovate. The investments in green research and development stood at around $30 billion in 2020, and we need to do more. Uh, these investments will be instrumental in developing the innovative solutions for the future, support a decarbonized circularity, a sustainable agriculture, a cleaner industry, and so on. The conversation is not only about spending indeed, it's also about addressing the way markets uh, finance these, uh, ex these, these processes and how they price the externalities. It means accounting really for the value of nature and the damage our economic activities cause to it. So incorporate the environmental dimension in all political and economic decision. We must also sh be sure to show solidarity by making sure that capital flows to create the supply chains in circularity in the developing world and ensuring that the developing nation see high benefits from the investments that they make uh, in uh, helping the world uh, solving these three planetary crises. In conclusion, we've got a unique opportunity and we really have now to kickstart, to accelerate the action uh, to create the world that we want for the future, living in harmony with nature for the benefit of all. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Director Pozzi. I will now invite delegates to join the debate. In order to allow the greatest possible participation, contributions will be limited to two minutes. I have already received indications that 16 speakers and heads of delegation will intervene in the debate according to the list that was shared yesterday. So I will first call Speaker Chowdhury from the House of Nations, Bangladesh. Speaker Chowdhury. Thank you, moderator. It's an honor for me to join the pre-COP26 parliamentary meeting in the beautiful city of Rome, Italy, with my delegation from Bangladesh Parliament. I express my heartiest congratulations to the organizers, the Parliament of Italy and Interparliamentary Union for organizing this very important event. I would just like to share very briefly the green approaches to COVID-19 recovery adopted by Bangladesh. Bangladesh is now focused on steering the country's progress towards poverty-free, climate-resilient, sustainable development with recovery measures. It is believed that no recovery can be possible unless it is fair, inclusive, and ambitious. Decades of development gains could be wiped out. For the economy recovery, from the COVID-19 crisis to be durable and resilient, a return to environment damaging business as usual investment patterns and activities must be avoided. Hence, instead of formulating a separate COVID-19 response and recovery plan, which could slow down the ongoing development initiatives, degrade the environment and harm the climate, Bangladesh has blended the COVID-19 recovery strategies in the macroeconomic framework, along with a broad-based strategy of inclusiveness, 
adopting a green growth strategy in its eight five-year plan. Despite being a highly climate vulnerable country, Bangladesh wants to actively play its part in the global collective action to reduce future GHG emissions. Even though the main focus of Bangladesh activities is on increasing resilience to the impacts of climate change, Bangladesh is also committed to follow a progressive approach to developing its economy on a low carbon pathway with increasing emphasis on renewable energy and energy efficiency. More than 6.2 million solar home systems installed in off-grid areas ensuring electricity access for 12% of its total population in remote areas. Now giving further emphasis on solar mini grid, solar irrigation, and rooftop solar projects. Time up. Thank you. Honorable Member Frast, Member of the Senate of the Netherlands. Good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues. COVID pandemic has given us a health argument. Mm -hmm. It obliged us to think about our health. It was a start of a disruptive thinking. It was rethinking our ecosystem. It was a rebooting our ecosystem. And in the beginning, everyone thought it was only for a few months. But two years later, we're still wearing masks FFP2 after being tested, and only a part of the world is vaccinated. So for us, restart the economy or our normal life, just like before the pandemic, was not an option. And because of the lockdown, we fought against loneliness. We were searching for small green places to recover the, the nature, to protect our economy. And so we take the opportunity and decide to, to get with the European Union to start up a national recovery resilience plans. We budgeted in Belgium only around 6 billion euros, but at least 50% of these 6 billion euros are green investments with focus on hydrogen grids, greening the mobility, greening the cities, but especially in energy efficiency. Because that kind of investment has a lot of advantages. Each kilowatt hour which is not consumed is the cheapest one and the greenest one, and really helps the households. So dear colleagues, maybe a little bit strange, strange to say, but take this opportunity of the pandemic to reboot your left. economy, but not in a normal way, just like before, but in a greener and other way. Thank you. Now, the Honourable Member, Maria Prast, Member of the Senate, uh, sorry, Andreas Griffroy, first vice president of the Senate of Belgium. He is called, and now Maria Pras, member of the Senate of the Netherlands. Prima di tutto, grazie al Parlamento italiano per la sua ospitalità. Sono lieta di poter contribuire come delegazione del Parlamento olandese, in quanto senatrice del Partito Animalista, al dibattito di oggi. Presento due suggerimenti per promuovere la sostenibilità, non richiedono fondi pubblici e non limitano la libertà di scelta dei cittadini. La settimana scorsa il ministro degli esteri olandese, rispondendo a una mia domanda nel Senato, ha detto che secondo il governo i prodotti di carne dovrebbero essere esclusi da qualsiasi promozione alimentare finanziata dalla Unione Europea. Invito tutti voi ad assumere la stessa posizione del mio governo. Perché è importante? Il consumo di carne è fra le cause principali del cambiamento climatico e la fame nel mondo. La produzione di un hamburger di manzo richiede 1500 litri di acqua e emette 1,5 kg di gas serra. Anni prima del Covid, l'ufficio scientifico del mio partito avvisava del rischio di una pandemia a causa dell'avvento degli animali. Il secondo suggerimento si ispira all'economia comportamentale. 
Il premio Nobel Richard Taylor ha mostrato che l'80% delle persone sceglie ciò che viene offerto come da standard. Per questo il partito animalista in Olanda ha proposto di rendere vegetariana la scelta standard per i pranzi e le cene ufficiali. Chi preferisce carne lo può esprimere in anticipo, così come di solito chiediamo di fare ai vegetariani. La città di Amsterdam, quasi tutte le università hanno scelto questo sistema carnivoro. Registrilo e invito tutti voi a mettere il concetto anche sul tavolo nei vostri paesi. Grazie dell'attenzione. Honorable member Fasino, chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Italian Chamber of Deputies. Grazie, Presidente. Io credo che questa è la COPS parlamentare. E allora la cosa che dobbiamo chiederci è qual è la responsabilità dei parlamenti e che cosa possono fare i parlamenti per realizzare gli obiettivi che ci sono stati indicati. Io credo che noi abbiamo due responsabilità. La prima riguarda il rapporto con i nostri elettori. Io credo che nei nostri collegi elettorali, nelle nostre constituency, nel rapporto con i nostri cittadini, noi abbiamo il dovere di guidare un incremento della sensibilità, della consapevolezza, della coscienza di quanto questo tema ambientale sia un tema strategico che richiede di essere considerata una priorità da parte di tutti. Abbiamo avuto una grande manifestazione nei giorni scorsi dei giovani e sappiamo quanto i giovani sono sensibili a questo tema. E tuttavia questa sensibilità non si ritrova in tutte le classi di età e in tutte le diverse classi sociali. E invece i temi che stiamo discutendo riguardano la vita, il futuro del pianeta, il futuro di ciascuno di noi e delle nostre società. È responsabilità di chi ha una rappresentanza politica lavorare perché i cittadini acquisiscano questa consapevolezza. E la seconda responsabilità deriva dall'essere noi legislatori. I nostri Parlamenti hanno il dovere di realizzare in termini legislativi gli obiettivi che qui vengono posti. Come si persegue la neutralità climatica, con quali strumenti legislativi, con quale norme, come si armonizza la legislazione fiscale, la legislazione per il finanziamento e l'incentivazione degli investimenti, per la ricerca, per la biodiversità. Insomma, come traduciamo in un'azione legislativa coerente gli obiettivi che qui sono posti come obiettivi strategici per il futuro del pianeta? Credo che questa sia la nostra responsabilità. Grazie. Honorable Member Zone, Chair of the Interparliamentary Committee of the House of Representatives of Indonesia. Thank you, Excellencies and Distinguished Delegates. I will be very brief by highlighting two points. First, the COVID-19 pandemic brought challenges to many aspects of our lives. However, it also gave us opportunity for paradigm shifting to move forward green economy and build a low carbon future. In our end of war to inject sustainability in our pathway of recovery, there is no one size fits all policy. All countries as countries have been different priorities and circumstances Hence, the green approach to recovery must be placed in the context of sustainable development and poverty eradication so that we will recover with no one left behind. In its process, the transition to a low carbon economy must be just, inclusive and affordable. And second, it is important for us to align COVID-19 recovery and climate change policies. Sustainable economic recovery could not be achieved if we are simply returning to our pre-COVID practices. Given our powers to enact laws and oversee government policy, Parliament is a key player to establish sustainable immediate and long-term recovery. We have to ensure that legislative measures to support recovery efforts will align with our long-term environmental targets. In addition to these two points, I would like to emphasize on global cooperation and multilateralism. COVID-19 has triggered global health and economic crisis that calls for greater international cooperation. And as member of parliaments, we must also promote partnership and cooperation between all countries and with different stakeholders. 20 seconds. To transform 
recovery challenges into economic opportunities and support climate action. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker Don, member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs of the National Assembly of Vietnam. Honorable Chair, uh, honorable delegates, in the current era, the development of green economies is an inevitable tendency. The serious impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic have further clarified that a lifestyle that is friendly to the environment and in harmony with the nature is necessary. Vietnam is one of the countries that have been most heavily affected by climate change. Therefore, we fully agree that the most appropriate and long-term option is green economic development. Economic growth must go together with social progress and equity. For green approaches to COVID-19 recovery, we would like to raise some thoughts. First, policies on green recovery and green economy should be developed and uh, implemented at regional and global levels in the framework of the 2030 SDGs and the Paris Ag Agreement on Climate Change. Second, we need to be a fair and effective legal framework to encourage and support organizations, individuals, and businesses with green development orientations and environmental protection. Third, public awareness on green approaches should be enhanced. And fourth, green transition requires an appropriate roadmap taking into account the different conditions and capacities of each country. In this process, all countries need, need to uphold the spirit of solidarity, share responsibility in technology, finance, health, especially at this time, COVID-19 vaccines and drugs, so that we can together overcome the pandemic soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker Don. And now, Honourable Member Mohamed Hassan Gusau, Member of the Senate of Nigeria. Uh, Mr. President, my dear speakers, uh, without doubt, Nigeria being a major oil producing country is not isolated in facing numerous climate related challenges, which indeed about five issues bothering the country, which is gas plowing, uh, as much as 1.5 billion cubic feet of gas, the atmosphere in the last eight years, two, the oil spillage in the Niger Delta region, three, desert encroachment, which has revenged many northern states, the sinking of Lake Chad Basin, which was once a source of abundant food supply, has quite been alarming. The duration and intensity of rainfall has increased, producing large run of unfloating in many places in Nigeria. In the face of all those thoughts, Nigeria government has not folded its hand in resignation. To its credit, the government has signed up to all international instruments and protocols related to climate change and litigation. It has implemented a series of programs, projects, toward climate change and litigation, as well as established several agencies dedicated to purpose. In 2015, the federal government of Nigeria committed itself and several other African countries to restoring more than 84 million hectares to the degraded land as part of the African Forest Land Restoration Initiative. On the side of legislative intervention, July 2021, 20 Nigeria National Assembly passed the long-awaited petroleum bill PIB, which has been assented to the, by the president, thereby giving the Board of Petroleum Industry Act 2021. The bill, which was presented in executive bill to the Sixth National Assembly in 2008, will pass go down as one of the most protected pieces of legislation in Nigeria. Thank you, Mr. Mr. President. Thank you. Honourable Member Gaius, Member of the Chamber of Deputies of Luxembourg. Thank you, Mr. President. I come from a very small country, so I try to be very short. Um, I see three COVID lessons. Um, the first one is we are living in especially important times, and what connects the COVID crisis to the climate crisis 
is that both have to do with the right for life and the right for health. And I think that we as parliamentarians, we understand that it is the time for the morally most important challenges and highest challenges that exist. The second lesson is, in the COVID crisis, we all knew what to do. And now in the climate crisis, we also all know what to do and what we have to do in the favor of our youngsters, in the favor of, ju of justice, of social justice, of the indigenous, of poorer people, and so on. So let's do it, because the COVID crisis taught us that worldwide crisis can be solved together. And the third lesson that I see in, from the COVID crisis is that even if we know what to do, sometimes it doesn't work out. And there are reasons, because if we stick to our old schemes, it cannot work. And so the vaccination distribution around the world didn't work as well as it had to work. And the same point will be a problem in the climate justice crisis. There will be countries who can afford the transition and there will be countries who cannot afford the transition. What we learned from the COVID crisis is we need very strong instruments for worldwide justice. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, Speaker, motion, Al Basora, Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives of Yemen. مساء الخير جئتكم من اليمن واليمن في بها حرب اليمن فيها فيها فاجعة كورونا وفيها فاجعة الحرب التي فرضت على بلدنا والذي نسعى إلى السلام فيها اليمن رغم الحرب وكوفيد الذي راحوا ضحايا كثير في كل دائرة انتخابية من دوائر انتخابية راحوا في كل بيت من, من ثلاثة وأربعة أفراد بهذه الجانحة ولكن رغم كل هذه المصاعب فإن البرلمان اليمني أقام مع الحكومة بأشياء كثيرة واليوم اليمن قد تحطت في أشياء كثيرة ولحقت اللقاح الأول واللقاح الثاني وتشكلت اللجاء على مستوى المحافظات والمديريات وكافة المناطق لكن اليوم عندنا فاجعة كبيرة باليمن وهي ناقلة صافرة التي بها مليون برميل نفط هذا المليون برميل نفط الناقلة متهالكة وهي على البحر قد تؤدي إلى تلوث جديد إذا لم يتدارك العالم وإرغام الحوثيين الإنقلابيين باليمن وإرغام كذلك دولة إيران الداعمة لهم حتى يستطيعوا نقل هذه ما هو موجود من داخل هذه الناقلة وإخراجها حتى لا يحصل تلوث لن تتأثر به اليمن ولكن ستتأثر به كل البلدان المحيطة بهذا البحر فأمل من خلال برلماننا ونحن برلمانيين أن نوجد, أن نوجد حل مثل هذه القضايا والسعي لإيقاف, لإيقاف الحرب ولكن أيضا مطلوب منا اليوم أننا نأتي بتشريعات جديدة تتواكب مع هذه الجانحة التي تخفف من معاناة مواطنينا وشعوبنا وناخبينا شكرا 20 seconds Thank you The Honourable Member Velkovsky Member of the Assembly of North Macedonia. Member Velkovsky? No? Okay. Dear Lord Speaker, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, this meeting has brought together parliamentarians from all around the world at a crucial moment when we are putting behind us almost two years make it by the COVID-19 pandemic. We should find a joint responses to fight pandemics such as COVID-19 and climate changes together, talking into account climate-related challenges in post-COVID-19 recovery plans. The upcoming COP26 meeting is an opportunity that should not be missed. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to overcome the consequences of the pandemic in the Republic of North Macedonia, we initiate support measures during the COVID-19 crisis, but also development measures in the post-COVID period. As a result of the implementation of six packages of measures worth about 11 percentage of our GDP, North Macedonia had one of the smallest GDP declines in the region. 
We took a step further and aligned the COVID-19 economic recovery measures with the European Green Deal. Our commitment to the green agenda is greater than ever, and we are fully committed to reducing pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, especially by decreasing our dependence on fossil fuels and focusing on more efficient energy use. In April, in April this year, we have adopted an updated national determined contribution to the Paris Agreement with which we have paved our way towards decarbonizing and more recently society. We have set a very ambitious goal by the year 20, 2030 to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by 51 percent compared to 1990. In order to achieve this ambition, our government adopted a long-term strategy on climate action, while the draft law of climate action is a final stage of preparation. So, because I don't have too much time, thank you for your attention, because we are in Italy, big grazie. Thank you. And now, Honourable Member Paul Dioye Umba, President of the Committee on Environment of the National Assembly of Gabon. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Le Gabon salue et félicite euh, le Parlement italien pour cette euh, grande réunion. Le Gabon a deux propositions à faire. La première, c'est celle de mettre un accent très appuyé sur la conservation des écosystèmes dans tous les continents et quel que soit le genre. La deuxième proposition c'est de procéder à une rénovation énergétique de l'habitat, c'est-à-dire vulgariser dans les habitations et les locaux commerciaux et industriels des technologies et équipements qui permettent d'économiser l'électricité et l'eau, par exemple les lampes et robinets programmables. De manière générale, il convient d'élargir, en particulier dans les pays en voie de développement, l'usage des points lumineux à basse consommation pour mieux gérer l'énergie, l'électricité, faire des économies à ce niveau-là. Je vous remercie. And now, Honorable Member Paul Nunez, Committee on Environment of the Italian Senate. La ripresa post-pandemica rischia di fallire gli obiettivi di giustizia ambientale e giustizia sociale per rincorrere con troppa precipitosa ansietà l'esigenza di recuperare la crescita economica persa durante la pandemia del 2020, ossia il PIL. Il pilastro dell'Europa ha un doppio obiettivo, ridurre il gas serra entro il 2030 del 55% e raggiunge la neutralità climatica entro il 2050. Ed è per questo che è stato stanziato il 37% della spesa di ogni PNRR per questo obiettivo. È un impegno importante e gravoso che non si ottiene imboccando strade sbagliate che ci impegneranno per i prossimi decenni, come la transizione energetica col gas, estremamente clima alterante, con operazioni di trasformazione di modelli produttivi troppo timidi o puntando ancora sulla liberazione, la liberalizzazione privata senza il controllo pubblico e col consumo predatorio delle risorse di suolo, aria, acqua e materie prime. Il pilastro della coesione sociale e territoriale si pone l'obiettivo di ridurre le disparità locali, le disuguaglianze di genere e di reddito demografiche. L'Europa ha attribuito fondi alle nazioni seguendo analisi e precisi criteri di disparità territoriali che vanno assolutamente perseguiti. La crescita economica, che ci appare ottimista, ottimistica in questa fase di ripresa, non ci deve far dimenticare che è frutto di politiche espansive dei Paesi e delle banche, con ampio ricorso al debito precipitose operazioni tese a riassorbire il debito potrebbero essere fatali per le economie di alcuni Paesi. Non va mai dimenticato che gli obiettivi sono giustizia sociale e giustizia ambientale. Dobbiamo affrontare l'emergenza climatica come abbiamo fatto con l'emergenza Covid-19. 
And now, honourable uh, member. Uh, Rogare, mi, mi, non avevo time up. Okay. Honourable member, Washington thank you. Varela. Thank you very much. Member of the National Assembly of Ecuador. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. En nuestro país mega diverso como Ecuador, que cuenta con las Islas Galápagos y la Amazonía, que forman parte del ecosistema de bosque húmedo tropical, el más extenso del planeta, es urgente fortalecer y recuperar la economía con iniciativas ecológicas, valorando la identidad cultural, los saberes ancestrales de los pueblos originales, los modelos indígenas de cultivo y la medicina, así como el uso sostenible de los recursos genéticos y biológicos. En escenarios de crisis como el cambio climático y la época de pandemia, los pueblos y nacionalidades andinas, amazónicas y del litoral enfrentaron y controlaron con sabiduría ancestral los riesgos climáticos, ecológicos y de salubridad a partir de buenas prácticas de usos de la biodiversidad, la autosuficiencia y la soberanía alimentaria y la solidaridad comunitaria con las grandes ciudades que fueron provistas de alimentos y medicinas ancestrales en base de brebajes, infusiones y sesiones espirituales, dando como resultado el control de los contagios a partir de la prevención y fortalecimiento del sistema inmunitario de las personas. Ecuador, para transitar del extractivismo hacia la sostenibilidad, requiere de políticas y marcos normativos que incentiven la bioprostrección, investigación y desarrollo tecnológico que permitan al mismo tiempo el fomento de innovadores cadenas productivas en torno a la bioindustria. Dichas políticas deben generar condiciones a los habitantes para inversión pública, privada y comunitaria que propongan soluciones a los retos de la degradación de los ecosistemas en el marco de la biodiversidad y la economía circular. Muchas gracias. And now, Honourable Member Pizarro, President of the Latin American and Caribbean Parliament. Member Pizarro, if not, okay, we'll then move on uh, to Honourable Member Chernogoy, Member of the National Assembly of Slovenia. The coronavirus, the coronavirus uh, has shaken Europe and the whole world. All the subsystems of any state were, were put to the test, especially our way of living together. Slovenia and all the member states are promoting a green Europe by implementing the next generation EU instrument, with, which, much, which must be adopted to the specific development of individual member states. As we said, united in diversity. As a young parliamentarian and Christian Democrat, I will strive to face the challenges of the citizens of Slovenia. The Slovenian parliament, the legislator in the country, will historically influence the transformation and development of the national economies in the green future. We will do this by giving priority to the green infrastructure, circularity, energy efficiency, investment in green jobs, mm -hmm. and innovation and digitalization. Young people have high expectation of new Green Deal. The quality of life in the area needs to improve. Furthermore, young people are the future. In Slovenia, the housing shortage is great. The possibilities for living are insufficient and mostly in large urban centers. For me, green also mean, means the immigration of young people to the countryside. In Slovenia and also elsewhere, the bureaucracy and some NGOs have already destroyed many sustainable projects. Wind farm, the placement of highways and railways place takes more than 10 years. Simplification and digitalization is the way to the future. A green policy can stimulate many industries, but it can also expel them from Europe. Likeability, populism at all costs without the population of the whole world does not lead to the welfare of green politics, but to a fullness. Europe must open up competitiveness, not close it down. Green and economy must go hand in hand. We must not miss the opportunity, but we must be aware that without thinking and doing out of the box, we will not be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Slovenia is closely following campa campaigns in nations by UK COP26 
26 presidency and we believe that represent a valuable input in our common global path towards climate neutrality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I honourable member Celic, member of the Parliament of Croatia. Honourable Member Cilic. Dear colleagues, setting up a new green infrastructure is what our societies and states need now. We, as parliamentarians, have a crucial role in assuring that the legal infrastructure is also put in place and that support regulation needed for public investment and enable private investment in green economy. Taking all that note, the Croatian Parliament has passed a number of documents that signal a shift towards a more sustainable and green economy. In that vein, particularly important is the National Development Strategy until 2030 that incorporates our main development course towards a green and digital transition. The strategy for adaptation to climate change to 2030 is also to mention. There is a number of other laws and regulations that cover this issue. I would also like to stress that we need to encourage public participation since COVID-19 lockdown and emergency measures had negative effects on the role of the general public in environment-related issues. To conclude, the world pandemic is a potential new starting point for our economic way of life to change how we live and to start respecting our environment that gives us energy, food, air and water. We have to ask ourselves whether the modern way of life and having a viable economy necessarily mean exhausting and devastating the nature. It is our moral imperative to understand that we humans are only leaseholders of this planet. Our children will inherit the earth in the state we live it in. Thank you. Thank you. Honourable Member Sanchez, Member of the Committee on Ecological Transition for the Congress of Deputies of Spain. Muchísimas gracias a la organización por permitirnos en este foro compartir preocupaciones y consensuar ambiciones. La COVID nos ha traído una de las mayores recesiones económicas de nuestra historia. Menos comercio, menos empleo, menos ingresos comerciales, pérdidas humanas e incertidumbre. Vivimos un momento histórico y es el momento de actuar. Tenemos que recuperar emocionalmente nuestros países, recuperar nuestras economías y el planeta ya no puede esperar más. Quizás seamos la última generación que pueda hacer algo. Y quisiera compartir tres reflexiones. Un mundo que quiera limitar el calentamiento global solo podrá ser circular. Así lo acredita la Organización Mundial del Clima. La segunda, la lucha contra el cambio climático y, las, y la economía o van de la mano o lo pagará nuestro medio ambiente y lo pagará el bienestar de las personas y de las familias. El tercer punto, es imprescindible que contribuyamos a una transición justa. No podemos dejar atrás a quienes más dificultades tengan para hacer la transición hacia modelos sostenibles, bien sea países, como se ha mencionado hoy aquí, empresas o ciudadanos. Solo llegaremos a buen puerto si hacemos la travesía juntos. Muchas gracias. And now, Honourable Member Hervé Mori, Member of the Senate of France. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Euh, mesdames et Messieurs, mes chers collègues, la pandémie a prouvé, s'il en était besoin, le lien entre l'activité économique et l'environnement. Déjà parce qu'il n'est pas invraisemblable que la pandémie ait été provoquée par des zoonoses, elles-mêmes consécutives à des dérèglements climatiques. Ensuite, parce que la baisse de l'activité économique a provoqué une baisse des émissions de CO2. Et selon le CDE, il faudrait que cette diminution de l'activité économique se prolonge jusqu'en 2030 pour pouvoir respecter l'ambition de ne pas dépasser un degré de réchauffement climatique. C'est dire l'importance des efforts qui doivent être faits. Et dans ce contexte, je crois qu'il ne faut pas que les plans de relance 
sacrifient l'écologie, mais au contraire qu'elles accélèrent la transition écologique. Ce n'est pas si évident que ça, parce que selon des études récentes de l'OCDE, aujourd'hui, seulement 48% des plans de relance qui ont été présentés dans le cadre des pays de l'OCDE mentionnent le, le climat. C'est dire que la situation n'est pas totalement satisfaisante. La France a inclus dans son plan de relance un volet écologie. L'Union européenne a également conditionné ses aides au respect d'objectifs environnementaux. C'est une bonne chose, mais je crois qu'il faut ensuite veiller à ce que ces objectifs, à ce que ces ambitions soient réellement tenues. La COP26 va très certainement permettre de revoir à la hausse des engagements qui ont été pris dans le cadre de la COP21. Là aussi, revoir à la hausse les engagements, c'est une bonne chose. Mais ensuite, nous devons veiller à tout ce que cela ne, la... ne reste pas lettre morte. Et je crois que le Parlement doit avoir un rôle plus important en la matière. Nous ne devons pas laisser, au... nous ne... Nous ne devons pas laisser à la société civile et aux organisations non gouvernementales le monopole d'être la... la vigie du respect des engagements pris en matière d'environnement. Et je crois que sur ce point, il faut être très, très vigilant et très impliqué. Et c'est ce à quoi je voulais vous appeler, mes chers collègues. Thank you very much. And now, Honourable Member Patasini, Member of the Committee on Environment of the Italian Chamber of Deputies. Honourable colleagues and colleagues, with the lentamento of the pressure sanitary of COVID-19, we are assisting a decisive repartance of the economy global. L'Italia sta segnando un più 6% di PIL, trainata al valore del Made in Italy a livello internazionale. C'è un complesso aumento dei, dei costi delle materie prime, fattore che sta mettendo in crisi diversi settori produttivi ed una crescente domanda di energia da parte del sistema industriale mondiale, con conseguente esplosione dei prezzi. L'Europa, con il Green New Deal, ha definito ambiziosi obiettivi per eliminare i gas serra entro il 2050, con forte impatto sui sistemi nazionali. È importante parlare quindi di decarbonizzazione sostenibile. Vi sono questioni di sostenibilità ambientale, in termini di consumo di suolo, sottratto all'attività agricola e di impatti sull'ecosistema. Vi è l'esigenza di tutela di un paesaggio spesso incontaminato. Ogni scelta non può prescindere dalla sostenibilità economica e dalla sostenibilità sociale, a partire dalla tutela dei soggetti più vulnerabili e deboli. I maggiori costi dell'energia, derivanti dalla necessità di sostenere con incentivi fiscali il processo di decarbonizzazione, colpiscono pesantemente le famiglie, sia direttamente in bollette, sia attraverso gli aumenti dei costi dei beni di consumo. Le attività economiche ne risentono e vedono indebolita la competitività a livello internazionale. Reputiamo che sia importante uno sviluppo sostenibile, non una decrescita felice che colpisce prima di tutto i più poveri. Maggiori livelli di energia richiesti allo sviluppo mondiale devono necessariamente derivare da una pluralità di fonti di produzione, non tralasciando misure finalizzate al rafforzamento, resilienza e sicurezza del sistema energetico, con riferimento agli impianti, alle reti e alle riserve strategiche. Quali ricadute potrebbero esserci in un Paese durante un giorno particolarmente nuvoloso e senza vento? È importante proseguire in questo processo di carbonizzazione, a partire da tutti insieme, lavorando insieme in un processo in cui ognuno faccia la sua parte. Adelante, Pedro, con giudizio, diceva Alessandro Manzoni nei promessi sposi al gran cancelliere di Milano mentre attraversava la folla in tumulto per la carestia durante l'epidemia di peste del 1630. Guardiamo avanti anche noi, ma con la giusta attenzione alla sostenibilità ambientale, economica e sociale. Grazie. And now, Honorable Member Gonzalez, members of the Senate of Argentina. Gracias, señor presidente. Gracias por la decisión también de darle voz a los parlamentarios del mundo. Para lograr convertir la recuperación verde de esta pandemia, la recuperación de esta pandemia en una recuperación verde sostenible, debemos poner en el centro de nuestras decisiones a la protección ambiental y a la inclusión social. Se trata de reconocer que el cambio climático es la principal amenaza a los derechos humanos de este siglo. Es una gran injusticia que pese a que los pobres del mundo casi no han contribuido a causar el cambio climático, son quienes más padecerán sus efectos. El gran desafío es hacer frente a esta crisis sin dejar a nadie afuera, sin dejar países en desarrollo afuera, sin dejar comunidades vulnerables afuera. De eso se trata la justicia climática, de eso se trata la transición justa. En nuestro país, Argentina, desde el Congreso de la Nación, 
hemos legislado y constituido un andamiaje institucional que hoy nos permite hacer frente a la crisis climática. Creamos el Gabinete Nacional de Cambio Climático, adherimos al Acuerdo de París, presentamos nuestra contribución nacional determinada, incrementamos nuestra ambición. Estamos haciendo un gran esfuerzo desarrollando energías renovables, protegiendo nuestra biodiversidad a través de la creación de parques nacionales, Estamos llevando adelante gestiones sostenibles en nuestras ciudades, pero no es suficiente. Si queremos acelerar estos cambios, si queremos cumplir con la carbono neutralidad al 2050, si queremos pasar de la palabra a la acción concreta, a la acción contundente, como piden nuestros jóvenes, como piden los jóvenes del mundo, los jóvenes argentinos y latinoamericanos, necesitamos ayuda. Necesitamos que se cumpla el financiamiento comprometido, no solo en mitigación, sino en adaptación, como decía la Presidenta del Senado de Italia. Los parlamentarios podemos cumplir y debemos cumplir un rol para garantizar que estos compromisos se cumplan a través de nuestro presupuesto nacional. Celebro que la declaración de esta jornada incluya el concepto de transición justa, porque como todos sabemos, tenemos responsabilidades comunes, pero responsabilidades diferenciadas. Gracias. Thank you very much. Colleagues, can I thank you for your very positive and enlightening contributions and your generosity in keeping rigidly to time. Now, with our two main speakers, I wonder if uh, the main speakers would like to sum up. Uh, speaker Nera or Speaker Potsy? Speaker Nera first and brief summing up. Gracias, señor presidente. Tres mensajes. Uno, si queremos una recuperación verde y saludable, tenemos que acordarnos de esa interrelación tan clara de la salud humana y la salud ambiental. Ese famoso concepto de One Health que incluye la salud humana, la salud animal y la salud ambiental. Sin ese concepto, creo que nuestra salud no va a estar protegida vamos a seguir muy vulnerables para la próxima crisis, que puede ser un agente infeccioso patógeno, puede ser el cambio climático, como ya está siendo, o puede ser eh, la contaminación del aire. Deuxième message. Vraiment, il y en a plein à gagner si on exécute ce plan de Paris, de, le traité de, de changement climatique. Plein de bénéfices pour la santé qui arriveront en train de diminuer la pollution de l'air, qui va diminuer les maladies respiratoires chroniques, les cancers du poumon, toutes les maladies, maladies dégénératives euh, cérébrales, qui aura plein de, 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 de l'argent que pour, on pourra épargner dans notre système sanitaire. Donc, plein de bénéfices pour la santé, très positifs, qui vont nous aider aussi à cette récupération économique, sociale, juste, comme on, on disait très bien, et puis qui va nous permettre d'avancer. Terzo messaggio, il sistema sanitario farà la sua parte, i professionali della salute, medici, ospedali, infermieri, tutti quelli che lavoriamo nella sanità pubblica, hanno cominciato già e stanno perdendo la pazienza perché vedono che si parla troppo del cambiamento climatico, però ancora la nostra salute è molto a rischio. C'è un contributo alle emissioni di, 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 di gas a effetto serra che viene dagli ospedali e c'è un compromesso di tanti ospedali attorno al mondo e l'OMS stimolerà questa quest iniziativa per arrivare a un sistema sanitario neutro di carbono, vuol dire in 20 anni fare che il sistema di salute e gli ospedali riescano a ridurre a zero le sue emissioni. Questo ovviamente è un contributo perché oggi il sistema sanitario, è, se fosse un paese, sarebbe il quinto nel mondo in tema di emissioni. Ovviamente ci sono molti paesi che non contribuiscono assolutamente, perciò è molto triste. Il mio ultimo messaggio, um, let me do it in English here. Last message. Zero pollution, a hundred health. And I will say it in French. Zero pollution, la santé va être la gagnante. Cero polución es la salud que va a ganar. Y en español, por finir, cero contaminación, 100 para la salud. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Thank you very much. And Director Potsy, any concluding remarks? It's working, yeah. 
Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and, and uh, not much to add to what uh, we've just heard. I, I would just would like to mention that, that again, at, at the heart of the triple planetary crisis are unsustainable patterns of consumption and production. And, and, and although they are unheavily distributed and, and the, the responsibilities for this uh, unsustainable consumption and production are are differentiated and there are different responsibilities, they do uh, impact us all. So we need to have a radical change, a just transformation, definitely, but with a, a common and differentiated responsibilities, that I, as I said, which is driven by the need to decarbonize. We, we need to do it as soon as possible. Every CO2 ton that goes into the atmosphere from now on is one ton too much. And, and really, really, the, the clock has been ticking. Uh, 50 years ago, UNEP was created with the idea that we would put the environment at the center of development. 50 years later, it's still not at the heart of development and policies. And, and let's not repeat the same mistake with, with climate change. You've heard for more than 20 years that there is an issue. We know the science has proven there is an issue. And so let's tackle it with solidarity, with multilateralism, and with effective environmental governance, which lays with Parliament uh, in their role as legislator, but also as, as, as decision makers in terms of budget and with your oversight responsibilities. Thanks. Thank you. I am informed that Director General Mature, one of the main speakers, wishes to sum up remotely. So. Uh, Director General Mature, are you on the line? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we heard all the parliamentarians speak today. All of them focused on the need, amongst other things, to enhance the renewable content in their energy mix. This is important. Mr. Speaker, we need to ask ourselves, why is it that we are not able to enhance the renewables share? Even though in many, many geographies, the vast majority of geographies in the world, renewable electricity, electricity from solar energy is today the cheapest electricity that you can get from any source. Mr. We need every leader in every country to consider solar as the energy source of choice. We believe that for this, we need to track what is happening, provide the information that is needed for advocacy within countries so that whether it is for climate mitigation or for reducing the local environmental uh, damages or for reducing the bill for energy imports or for enhancing the quality of life of people, we have the information that it needs to move to solar. Mr. Speaker, we also need to ensure that there is capacity in all countries, financial capacity, which I talked about, as well as people capacity, policy capacity to move ahead. And finally, Mr. Speaker, we need to ensure that there are real projects, real projects that create the demand that help move policy and processes and move in money into all countries. Mr. Speaker, I will end by emphasizing how important it is for all of you to get together to enable this change to occur in every country of the world. Thank you very much. Th thank you very much, all. And can I once again thank the main speakers, Speaker Nare, Speaker Mature, and Speaker Potsey for their contribution, but also for the members and the delegates who provided us with informed and enlightening speeches. So I am very grateful for that in that session. As many honourable members have said this afternoon, the efforts to deliver the post-COVID economic recovery have to focus too on the necessary global transition to a green economy. Each taken alone would have the potential to intimidate us, but taken together, they have the potential to overwhelm us. But the stakes are too high to take no action at all, and the goal is too valuable. 
Our colleague from the Netherlands spoke about, and I quote, the right to life and the right to health. And he is correct. This is what our efforts should be focused on. Another theme of our debate today was inequality. Described another way, not all of us are embarking on this journey, a journey we must all complete from the same starting point. Geographical inequality is something we should not lose sight of. In fact, as our Italian colleague was saying when she ran out of time, the dual imperatives of social justice and environmental justice should be in our minds at all times when formulating public policy relating to the global economic recovery. Our colleague from Spain described this as a just transition, and many colleagues described this as a moral imperative, something we owe to future generations. And I know we will all agree on this point. So this concludes our panel in session one. I am informed that we're going on straight away to session two. There will be no break. So I wish you a pleasant event, and I look forward to continuing the discussion. So many, many thanks indeed.